Hello and welcome to lecture 16, part 1, where we will review the awesome things that we learned in lecture 15. So, what did we do last time at the lecture 15? Well, we introduced the concept of moment of inertia tensor. And we have shown that the kinetic energy of a body whose uh, center of mass is pinned down and uh, the body is rotating around its center of mass at an angular frequency omega uh, is going to have the kinetic energy relative to its center of mass that's given by one half omega i omega j times i i j where IIJ is the moment of inertia tensor. So moment of inertia tensor I uh, with subindex I subindex J is the sum over all the different pieces that the body is made of. Uh, so it's uh, dm mass of that piece times R squared times delta IJ minus R I R J. That is our moment of inertia tensor. And uh, specifically in Cartesian coordinates, we can write uh, I I J in this form, uh, sum over all the different pieces of the body or different masses if we're considering a bunch of point masses. Um, and uh, this mass is multiplied by a matrix in three dimensions. Um, I and J uh, can go between 1 and 3 inclusive, and so it's a 3 times 3 matrix that looks like this. Y squared plus C squared for the IXX, and now I'm going to write out the rest of the matrix that we've seen uh, the previous time. So it has minus XY over here uh, in the IXY. Uh, part because I x y has uh, this equal to x that equal to y and so this is simply minus uh, r x r y which is just x y and delta x y is zero so all of the L diagonal terms are given by this product of coordinates and all the diagonal terms are given by r squared minus uh, x squared here, minus y squared here, and minus z squared over there. So that is our moment of inertia tensor. Now, one key thing that we discussed is how this moment of inertia tensor depends on the axis choice uh, of our coordinate system, right? We can pick any Cartesian coordinates, x, y, and z, and we can rotate them uh, relative to any other system. And so if we have new coordinates, r prime, uh, that are given by a rotational matrix A uh, that multiplies the old coordinate R, uh, then as a result, our moment of inertia tensor uh, will transform in the following way. I prime in the new coordinates uh, is going to be equal to A, the rotational matrix, uh, the old values of the uh, moment of inertia tensor, uh, times the transposed uh, version of uh, the rotational matrix. So that is how the moment of inertia tensor transforms. And the physics behind this is, well, if we have an expression for i in the old coordinates, well, let's rotate back to the old coordinates, which is precisely what uh, a tilde or a transpose does. Uh, then here is our tensor. And then let's uh, rotate the coordinates forward to, to get us uh, to the prime coordinate system. So this makes sense uh, at an intuitive level. And uh, finally, uh, the last thing that I wanted to uh, overview is uh, how do we approach uh, the moment of inertia tensor? How do we work with it? Uh, what is the most um, um, natural way of dealing with it? And uh, one of the most natural ways of dealing with it actually is to work 
in the body frame. So we will pick a frame that is baked into our rigid body. If we're considering uh, rotation of the Earth, uh, we're going to plant our three axes, X, Y, and Z, into the Earth. So as the Earth rotates, the axis would rotate together with it. So that is called the body frame. So that's exactly where we are going to be working. So you can always pick the principal axis in which uh, the moment of inertia tensor is diagonal so that only diagonal components are non-zero and everything else of diagonal is zero. And uh, in such principal axis, uh, which always exists for a rigid body, uh, we can uh, write out therefore the kinetic energy in the simplified form because all of the old diagonal components go away and so we are left with the sum of only the three diagonal terms I1 1 prime times omega 1 prime where primes indicate uh, the expressions uh, in the new rotated frame uh, which is our body frame. In the future we're going to be dropping the primes and uh, working in the body frame by default. Thank you for sticking with me for this brief review of lecture 15 and uh, we're now going to move on to lecture 16.2 where we're going to be talking about uh, rigid body dynamics uh, and free precession. Uh, a really important topic, gyroscopes and stuff, uh, I'm super excited about it. Uh, please do the quiz as usual and I'm going to see you then. Bye. Hello and welcome to part 2 of lecture 16. Where are we going to be talking about um, moment of inertia and what to do with it? Ultimately our goal is to get to the free precession of a rigid body. Basically we spun it up and let it go without any external torques. But before we get there, uh, why don't we take a look at how does the moment of inertia work in a few simple cases. So the first uh, example that we're going to consider is going to be that of a rigid rod. So let's say we have our coordinate system, x, y, and z, and uh, we're going to place a rigid rod along the z-axis of this coordinate system. So we're going to do something like this. So that's our rod. Uh, the length of the rod is uh, going to be L, and uh, the radius of the rod is uh, A, so the diameter is twice that. Uh, twice a. And so uh, we would like to try and uh, obtain its moment of inertia tensor. First, let's simplify things and uh, consider the case of a equal to zero. So we will have an uh, infinitesimally thin rod. So it will be uh, just uh, a line mass distribution along the z-axis uh, of length l. And let us try and compute uh, the moment of inertia tensor. And as an example, let's compute the xx component of the moment of inertia tensor. What would that be? Well, uh, we will write it down based on the definition that we have right over there uh, below on the page to the left. And uh, that is nothing but sum over m times y squared plus z squared. Remember, ixx doesn't have x squared in it. So this is simply r squared minus x squared. So uh, you can see that because our a is equal to zero, our y squared will go down to zero. And uh, uh, this is something that's familiar. Uh, we basically need to integrate uh, dm times z squared. So let's try and integrate that. So how would we approach that? Well, uh, first of all, we would need to write down what is dm, and we did that previously a couple of times. So dm uh, will be dz, right, uh, divided by the total length of the rod and multiplied by the total mass of the rod. So uh, that will tell us how much mass is sitting within an interval dz uh, of our rod. And so then uh, we are ending up with an integral uh, that looks just like that. Uh, we will be able to take m over l 
uh, out as a factor and here we're going to get an integral of z squared dz mm -hmm. and so what is this going to be well uh, the result is going to be m over l uh, times z cubed over 3 where we're going to be uh, using the substitution from minus l over 2 uh, to l over 2. And we can easily evaluate that and uh, we are going to end up with uh, ixx uh, equal to, so z cubed, uh, if we plug in l over 2, will be l cubed over 8. Uh, then because we're going to evaluate it at both plus and minus l over 2, uh, we're actually going to double up the result uh, and uh, so the result will be m l squared over 12. You may remember that from the kinetic energy uh, or from the angular momentum that we computed uh, for a rotating rod previously in the course. Uh, what's interesting is that if we were to set a to be non-zero, uh, then we would actually get a contribution from a as well. Uh, and uh, we're going to get uh, in the end uh, an addition of ma squared over 4 over here with the full moment of inertia tensor uh, taking the following form. So the top left corner here, the xx component, is what we wrote out here. It turns out that the yy component is the same due to symmetry, right? Because the x and y uh, axis are identical. Uh, we can, in fact, uh, uh, rotate the rod and uh, nothing will change. So this rotational symmetry uh, can uh, let us guess what the answer is uh, right away, but we can also compute it. And uh, for the last component, uh, for the ZZ component, we can also guess what the answer is, because if our rod is infinitesimally thin, then there will be no moment of inertia uh, for us to find, because everything is sitting on the axis, therefore there is no rotational velocity if we were to try to spin our rod with a equal to zero around the z-axis. So we would get zero over here. But because uh, in the case of non-zero a, we're going to actually have some elongation uh, perpendicular, transverse to the z-axis, we actually are going to get a contribution uh, which looks like that, ma squared over 2, which is a familiar answer for some of you uh, who have dealt with the moment of inertia uh, of a wheel, of a uniform disk, uh, which is precisely what it is. So that is our matrix. And what about the off-diagonal terms? Well, it turns out that we have chosen the axis luckily We've directed them along the axis of symmetry, and uh, we have uh, lucked out in the sense that we have uh, picked them to be along the principal axis. And so all the off-diagonal terms actually turn out to be zeros. So this is our moment of inertia tensor uh, for this uh, awesome cylinder. And I'm not going to show uh, how to obtain ma squared over 4 uh, contributions for x, x, and y terms uh, that hopefully we can cover uh, during this section. Thank you very much for the attention. And in the next part, we're going to go and discuss the parallel axis theorem. So don't forget to do the quiz. And uh, we're going to move into part 3. See you soon. Hello and welcome to part 3 of lecture 16 where we're going to be talking about moment of inertia scalar. We kind of already used the concept of moment of inertia scalar when we were solving uh, the cylinder problem, namely when we looked at the uh, ZZ component of the moment of inertia tensor, uh, we have uh, concluded that it will be the same as that of a disk of radius a. Um, perhaps intuitively it's clear, but let's now formalize why we expect that to actually be the case. So let's uh, look at the moment of inertia scalar. So what is moment of inertia scalar? Well, if, it's a, if a tensor um, retains the information about the distribution of mass in the body in all directions, 
uh, moment of inertia scalar retains the information about distribution of mass in the body around a particular axis. So uh, that is moment of inertia about an axis. So uh, mathematically, what we can do is we can write that moment of inertia scalar uh, along the axis given by a unit vector n hat is going to be given by n i hat times n j hat uh, times i i j, the moment of inertia tensor. So let's uh, consider an example. Suppose that uh, our angular velocity is pointing along vector n hat. And uh, we have fixed n hat. So in this case, our kinetic energy uh, will take this form. Or uh, we can use the definition of moment of inertia scalar and rewrite this as simply one half uh, times the moment of inertia scalar times omega squared. This is precisely why we associated IZZ of a cylinder with the moment of inertia around the Z axis, because that is precisely what moment of inertia scalar would be uh, for N along the Z axis. So uh, let's now write it down. For instance, for the rod, uh, the moment of inertia scalar along the x-axis is going to be ml squared over 12 plus ma squared over 4. And uh, similarly, the moment of inertia about the z-axis would be ma squared over 2. So what we're doing here is we're plucking out the top left xx component right there uh, from the moment of inertia tensor. Uh, and here we're plucking out the izz component from there at the bottom. Uh, so no magic here. We're just using the definition. But intuitively, uh, this is what we're actually doing. So uh, with that, let us now uh, try and uh, work uh, with the moment of inertia scalar to get a better intuitive picture of how does the moment of inertia change as we change the axis about which we compute the moment of inertia. And that is given to us by parallel axis theorem. Suppose that we have uh, axis A about which we would like to compute moment of inertia and we have the original axis that went through the center of mass of our body. So that was our body, that was its center of mass, and this is our axis that we denote with C that goes through the center of mass. This is center of mass. What is the expression for the moment of inertia around uh, the C axis? Uh, that will be simply the sum over all mass times xc squared plus yc squared, where xc and yc are coordinates relative to uh, the c axis. So what will be the moment of inertia scalar uh, in the z direction relative to the a axis, which is displaced relative to the c-axis by a distance capital X, big X. So uh, we would, uh, of course, write down the equivalent expression uh, where we would replace xc and yc with xa and ya. And uh, uh, if uh, we have shifted by x in the x direction, by y in the y direction, then we would write that uh, xc uh, is equal to xa plus x, and yc is equal to ya plus y. We can combine the terms, and uh, we can get that 
this is equal to to this, uh, where this is the original a moment of inertia scalar around the uh, axis going through the center of mass. And this is m times r perpendicular squared, because x squared plus y squared is by how much we have displaced the axis uh, horizontally and two and away from u. There are other terms that I have conveniently dropped. I'm going to write them out here, but there will be zeros. And uh, if you're wondering why both of them vanish, well, it's because of the definition of the center of mass. Namely that because x is the distance away from the center of mass, if you weigh the distance by mass and sum up over the body, you will get a zero. So this term goes down to zero, just as uh, this term does as well. So we are indeed left with just these uh, two terms. And so the conclusion from this is pretty awesome, uh, that our moment of inertia about a new axis is equal to moment of inertia about the axis that is parallel to it and going through the center of mass of the body plus the mass of the body times the square of the distance between the two axes. So for instance, we can consider an example of what would be what would be the moment of inertia relative to the axis that passes through the end of the rod. And here we will have a rod that looks like this. So we have an axis that goes through the end of the rod and an axis that goes through the center of the rod. And the distance between them is going to be r perpendicular, or here I try to draw it the same as x. And uh, we know that the moment of inertia of a rod about its center of mass is ml squared over 12. Now, if we shift by half the length of the rod from the center of the rod to one of its ends, then we're going to add m l over 2 squared to it. So we're going to have m l squared over 12 plus m l squared over 4. It's l over 2 squared. And uh, because I'm running over, out of space here, I'm going to write that the final answer will be uh, simply ml squared over 3. So this shows the power of the parallaxis theorem. Once we have computed a moment of inertia about the center of mass of a body, we can compute moment of inertia about uh, any axis parallel to uh, that going through the center of mass by simply adding m r perpendicular squared to the value of moment of inertia scalar that we computed around the original axis. And that's it for part three of lecture 16. And I'm going to see you in lecture 16.4. Uh, do the quiz, have fun, and I'm going to see you soon. Hello and welcome to part four of lecture 16, where are we going to be talking about free precession. So what is free precession? Well, suppose that we have a body, a rigid body, uh, that is uh, spinning with an angular velocity omega around its center of mass. And what we want is we would like to figure out um, what happens in time to this body, you know, after it spins for a while. So how would we do that? Well, we're going to use Lagrangian approach. And uh, the first thing that we can notice is that because there are no external torques applied to this body, the total angular momentum vector, L, is going to be conserved. So L is equal to a constant. And we can express L, of course, as the sum over uh, every little bits and pieces that uh, we can break the body into. Um, so the mass of individual piece times R cross V of that piece the regular expression for the angular momentum of 
uh, a body. And uh, uh, because we have rotation uh, that is happening around the center of mass, which is sitting still, it means that we can write down the velocity of this body simply as omega cross r. It's a pure rotation. So here we can use a vector identity uh, that states that a cross b cross c is equal to back minus cap. Um, this is a, this is b, this is c. So we will be able to write that this is equal to b times a dot c will be omega times r r minus c which is uh, going to be r times a dot b uh, will be r times omega. Uh, so that's good. Of course r dot r is just going to be r squared and uh, we're going to uh, massage this a little bit where we're going to uh, switch from the vector notation to a component of vector notation. So we're going to be from now on, instead of writing L vector, we're going to uh, write Li, the ith component of the L vector. And uh, if we take an ith component of this vector, it will look like m times omega i times r squared minus r i r j times omega j. Uh, it will be useful to use a trick because you see it would be nice to be able to take omega j out as a factor. Um, so we could do that by replacing omega i with omega j times delta i j. Uh, because we multiply omega j by a term that's only non-zero when i is equal to j, that means that we uh, didn't really change anything. This is equivalent to omega i. Uh, there should be no vector sign over here above. So we can rewrite this by factoring out omega j. Uh, keep in mind that omega is the same for all the bits and pieces into which we broke down the body. So we can take it out as a factor outside of the sum over m and uh, what we're left with is nothing but the moment of inertia tensor so what we end up with is simply omega j times i i j and therefore what we conclude is that the moment uh, of inertia determines the angular momentum the angular momentum of the body is the moment of inertia tensor times uh, omega. And uh, remember that for the kinetic energy, uh, we had also that the kinetic energy is equal to one half times i i j times omega i times omega j. So you can see that moment of inertia uh, tensor plays a role that is rather similar uh, to mass for linear motion so that our momentum p was m times v and our kinetic energy was one half m v squared. So here we're replacing the scalar mass with uh, a tensor moment of inertia and uh, linear velocity with angular uh, velocity. But otherwise there is a pretty clear parallel. So now let's make use of the fact that the angular momentum is actually constant, doesn't change in time, to derive the equations of motion uh, of our body. So in the lab frame, the constancy of L is simply d dt of L equal to zero. And that is a time derivative valued in the lab frame. Now, because we want to write down our equations of motion in the moving frame or the body frame of the body uh, or the body frame of the body uh, we're going to have to switch our coordinates to the body frame which we can do using the old trick uh, remember that when we are switching from the lab frame uh, to a rotating frame uh, that rotates at an angular frequency omega then we replace the time derivative in the lab frame with ddt plus omega cross 
And so this is how we're going to be switching between the lab frame and the body frame. And this, of course, needs to be zero. So now this is our equation. And because iij is a constant in body frame, and uh, this equation gives us zero in body frame, we can actually write down uh, the equations of motion rather easily. So if we pick principal axis, then we can write down the uh, expressions for the angular momentum in the body frame in principal axis because all the off-diagonal terms for our moment of inertia tensor uh, vanish in principal axis by the definition of principal axis. Then using this, uh, we can actually write down in the body frame that the x component of this equation uh, becomes simply so this is ddt of l1 plus omega cross l. The first component of that uh, is going to be equal to zero. Or uh, equivalently, we can replace this uh, with uh, simply omega 2l3 minus omega 3l2. So from here, we can now write it out without any cross products in components. And what we're going to get is I11 times omega 1 dot, which is exactly the same as here, plus omega 2 and L3 is I33 times omega 3, or we can uh, drop one of the 3s here. So we're going to be uh, ending up with I1, I2, and I3 for uh, simplicity of the notation, and uh, uh, L3 will be I3 times omega 3, L2 will be I2 times omega 2, so we're going to be able to factor out omega 2, omega 3. And here we're going to be ending up with I3 minus I2, and all of that is equal to zero. We can obtain the rest of the equations of motion for the two other components by cycling through uh, the indices. So here, for instance, uh, because I now use the notation that simplified, instead of 1, 1, I'm going to have simply 1. So here, just as a reminder, all we did was we cycled uh, through uh, the indices. So for instance, 1 becomes 2, 2 becomes 3, 3 becomes 1, uh, because uh, if you add 1 to 3, you get 4, but we don't have 4, so we go back to 1, and uh, so on. So that's how we can get the equations of motion. And these are nothing but Euler equations. And uh, we have three equations for three unknowns, uh, which means uh, that we can solve for omegas in the body frame, which is precisely what we're going to be doing in the next part of our lecture, 16.5. I hope you enjoy that, and I hope that you will enjoy the quiz, and I'm going to see you in the next part. Hello and welcome to lecture 16.5, where we will finally solve Euler's equations. Let's start with something simple. How about Let's try to figure out what is the steady state of a body depicted right here that is rotating about its center of mass uh, initially at an angular frequency omega. Steady state means that all of the omega dots are zero. So that implies that from the Euler equations of motion that we wrote right there, the only way this can be true is if two omegas are zero. For instance, it could be omega 1 equal to omega 2 equal to zero. So the solution to our steady state is that our body is spinning about one of its principal axes. So let's make things more interesting. 
suppose that we will add perturbations to uh, this beautiful steady state. Namely, let's choose omega 3 equal to omega 3 0 and uh, set i1 equal to i2. So we will assume that the body is axisymmetric around the third axis or the z axis. We will relax this assumption later. So let's write down the Euler equations in a slightly different form. So we're going to get You can see that in all of these cases we have pretty similar situation. Uh, the last equation is a bit special because of our uh, assumption that the body is axisymmetric, so i1 is equal to i2, and therefore this term vanishes, and hence from here we are going to get that omega 3, which is given initially by omega 3 0 is actually going to be a constant of motion which is going to be useful the more constants the better uh, let's try and combine these first two equations and uh, uh, we're going to get from here uh, that omega 1 double dot plus omega 1 times omega 3 0 uh, times delta i over i squared is equal to zero. And here I have introduced delta i, which is the difference uh, between uh, i3 and uh, i2, and this therefore will be minus delta i. Uh, this simplifies the notation somewhat. And how did I get this equation? Well, I took a time derivative of the first equation, keeping in mind that omega 3, 0 is a constant. Uh, I then turned omega 2 into omega 2 dot, so now I can plug omega 2 dot from the second equation into the first equation, and then I arrive at this precise equation over here. And this equation is the regular um, harmonic oscillator equation, right? Because uh, this term uh, is a constant, omega 3, 0 doesn't change. In fact, uh, we're going to uh, denote this as omega squared. And if we do that, then we find that the solution for omega 1, or at least one of the solutions uh, up to a phase, will be a times cosine omega t. By um, a simple substitution, we can verify that uh, the solution for omega 2 will be a times uh, sine omega t. And uh, here in this case, just to be clear, uh, omega is equal to omega 3, 0 times uh, delta i over i. So what are we getting here? Um, is that our body is uh, going to have uh, its uh, angular velocity vector tracing out a cone, as we can see over here. So if we were to draw a cartoon, then we would see something like this. We have a body uh, with uh, its uh, vector omega sticking out let's say this is our omega 3 0 the initial velocity uh, before the perturbations then we give the system a perturbation so that it develops deviations from uh, the uh, original omega 3 0 and the tip of vector omega is going to be going about in a circle around omega 3 0 let's uh, consider a fun example um, what can be more fun than the Earth? Earth is not perfectly spherical. In fact, its delta i over i is 1 over about 306. And in fact, Euler proposed that Earth could Earth's omega could rotate with a period of 306 days that we expect uh, from here. 
this is a predicted period. In reality, uh, we don't see this period. We see a period of one year, uh, that is seasons. We also see a smaller one, smaller signal at 433 days. And uh, that is called Chandra Wobble. The difference uh, from 306 days, we believe comes from the fact that the Earth is not a rigid body. And what causes uh, the perturbations to Earth's rotation to occur? So there is forcing by wind and ocean, and uh, there is uh, damping by, by the ocean and the mantle. Thank you very much for your attention. That's all for today. And uh, I hope you had fun. Uh, next time, we're going to start the lecture with uh, a live experiment, live on camera or live on tape, as Colbert likes to say. And uh, that will involve throwing up either a box or a piece of electronics into the air and me successfully or not catching it. So it will hopefully be uh, an interesting observation for you to make and uh, hopefully I will not have to buy new pieces of electronics the next time I film this lecture. And uh, with that, I hope that you will do the quiz and I hope that I will see you in lecture 17. Have a wonderful weekend and I'm going to see you next week.